Hi, I'm Najia Maxfield. I currently live in Canton, Michigan, although I'm from Hutchinson, Kansas. I've been Muslim for 20, almost 28 years. And um, I'm currently working as di editorial director of Daybreak Press, which is a subsidiary of Rabata, which is a uh, Muslim women's organization that's run by Anze Tamra Gray, who studied in Syria. And uh, I'm also an author of a young adult novel called Sophia's Journal, about a young Muslim girl who falls in a river and goes back in time to when there were slaves and fights for the freedom of the people that she meets and uh, has all kinds of adventures. It's been being used in the Minneapolis Public School District and, um, and several Islamic schools, so we're trying to get it into the, into the school systems to be taught either in the social studies programs or in the language arts programs. Life today as a Muslim is, we live in one of the most challenging times to be Muslim, but that means that it's also one of the greatest opportunity times. We live in a time where, you know, we, we came, the, there was a big push in the 60s and 70s of immigration of Muslims coming from overseas, and most of them came to go to school, and they kind of settled and they raised their families, and now we're kind of, we're kind of getting to the second and third generation. And those first generations were busy adapting to life and raising their kids, and some of them were kind of um, fearful or wary of the larger community. So there was a lot of um, insular kind of thinking. There was kind of a side effect was people didn't intend to be insular, but that was kind of a side effect. We didn't really reach out as much as we should have. And then when 9-11 happened and people started to kind of American people put Muslims kind of on their global radar, there was fertile ground for fear to grow. And all of the media and people from the government and people from, you know, other places were planting seeds in that fertile ground. But why did that fertile ground exist? It was fertile because we let it be fertile. We let, we let that fear grow because we weren't really living up to our responsibility of reaching out. And that doesn't mean just like making dawah and, you know, preaching at people. It means being a member of the PTA, you know, taking a walk with your neighbor, um, taking your neighbor food when they're sick, all of those things that we as Muslims should be doing anyway, um, but doing them proudly as Muslims and letting people see that we're Muslims and this is how we interact with others. We're kind, we're open. We hadn't really been doing that as well as we could have. So that fear kind of grew, and now that it's snowballed and we've reached the position now where because of geopolitical uh, circumstances and also because of deliberate fear-mongering all over the West, we've come to a point where people really are not just, not just ignorant and not just afraid of Muslims, but downright paranoid. So we have the opportunity, what a blessed opportunity we have to just to wear our Islam with joy and show people what Islam is really about. So living in Islam today, in, here, I've had, I've been Muslim 28 years, I have had precisely one thing that I would call a real kind of negative interaction. And that was, um, we were in a very, very tiny little town in Kansas and it was with my mother in law. And I hate to say that because Kansans really aren't like this. So this guy was an anomaly. <laughs> um, and I was with my mother in law and my kids. And I had, this was when George Bush was president, the second George Bush. And I had some very um, strong opinions about that on my bumper in the form of bumper stickers. And so this young gentleman. Um, started passing by us, driving back and forth and passing by us as we were driving with some very um, colorful finger language going on. And then when we stopped to eat, he stopped across the street from where we were eating and waited for us to come out. Alhamdulillah, there, were, there was a police officer, thank God there was a police officer there eating as well. And we told him, this guy's been following us and you know, we're kind of scared to go out. He said, oh my gosh, and everybody in the whole place was like, who is that? We don't know him. Where did this guy come from? So the police officer escorted us out, and everyone else in the restaurant showed my mother-in-law what Kansans are really about. That's the, that's the beauty of it, is that 
people in America really have good hearts and people who are Muslim really have good hearts, but those hearts haven't gotten together. So, you know, that's what we have, that's what the work that's before us. Other than that, I've you know, I've had people yell something out their car window or whatever, but I don't even, those don't even count. So 28 years, one negative experience. Everything that I've, in fact, since it's gotten so bad, there's been an absolute effort on people's part, I swear to God. People meet your eyes, they they hold the doors open for you, they, they, they give you an extra thank you. They want to make sure that you know that they're not one of those mean people. First of all, hijab is like, there, there are several benefits that, that I see to hijab all the time. One is that it creates a desexualization of public space so that you have just simply removed that tension that, you know, people say, oh, there was sexual tension or, oh, you know, he held my hand when he shook it just a moment too long or blah, 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 or I met his eyes or whatever, da, da, da. you know, like, we just don't think on that level. When you're wearing hijab, you present yourself as someone who wants to be taken as for her intellect and for her uh, contribution to society, not for not for anything else. Like you just take that possibility of that playful uh, kind of sexy interaction off the table. It's not even there. Um, another thing is that especially when you're young, you meet and when you meet people for the first time, and you present yourself as a person who's wearing hijab, everyone you meet knows that that's your priority. Religion is your priority. Like, you're a person of faith. And so when they say, let's go to the bar, or let's go to the dance, to the club, or whatever, anything that's inappropriate for you, and you say, no, no, I'm not, I, I'm not going to go, or whatever. You don't have to explain why. They know why, because you're a person of faith. Then, then you, don't, you don't have that whole chestnut of having to think up why and explain to them why, and, well, I'm Muslim, so I don't do that. And, and then, they, then, it, then it opens more doors for them to say, well, why does... Islam doesn't like, how come you can't have fun, blah, blah, blah. But if they know from the first second that you're a person for whom faith is important, then they don't question that later. So that makes life easier. Now, as far as right, right now, these days, um, hijab, well, it's like, it's like jihad 24-7. It's like you get all the hasanat of worship and jihad and or just by walking out your door. You're going to go to the post office, you're going to go to the grocery store, hasanat, 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 you're just racking it up because you're, you're in constant state of worship and a constant state of sacrificing because uh, you, you are a potential target. And so uh, even though we haven't had a lot of targeting, I personally haven't had a lot of targeting, and most of my friends haven't, but they're are there is an increase. We can't deny that there is an increase in hate crimes and there is an increase in um, Muslims being victims of either um, uh, violence or uh, vandalism, violence or vandalism uh, recently. So uh, I don't find, I've always worn hijab so I don't feel any different and I always feel like if you just portray to people happy countenance and you're happy and welcoming to see them then then they're happy to see you and it doesn't matter what you're wearing so uh, hijab is a protection on on many many levels well alhamdulillah alhamdulillah it's an honor alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i grew up in hutchinson kansas which is right in the middle of kansas and it's kind of a little rural community it's not rural rural as in one stoplight. It, when I grew up there it was about between 35 and 45,000 people. So there were 300 people in my graduating class, 325-ish. And um, you know we had I think well-established things with well-established sports and I was on the debate team and I was in band and so, um, so I was active when I was in high school and um, I was raised American Baptist and it was a beautiful beautiful community to be raised in. And they, you know, they really instilled in me a lot of the values that I, that I was able to continue in Islam. That, um, you know, you're kind to others, that you love your community, that you participate and offer whatever you have. You serve. You serve in order to lead and serve in order to get closer to God. And so these are values that Muslims have as well. Um, and uh, I, I, when I was about 11... I told my parents that I wanted to be a missionary 
and although as I got older that you know there was an in-between time where I went to high school and I kind of uh, I, I didn't really focus on that I was still practicing Christian but I didn't really focus on that um, as much then as it turns out I grew up and became Muslim and then and now I give you know talks and do dawah and stuff so it's like I became a missionary for Islam <laughs> so um, but yeah growing up in Kansas was really a blessing Heart, hardy people with good hometown values and lots of support and it's really it's really an enigma because people say you know there's a book called what's the matter with Kansas or what's wrong with Kansas about the political climate in Kansas and how conservative it is and I think that the reason it's like that is because people are very socially conservative people are moral people have good moral fiber and they really care about what's right and what's wrong and so Politically, that translates sometimes into things that kind of cross a line into we're right and moral and nobody else is. So uh, kind of on a more political level, Kansas kind of doesn't really represent what Kansas itself really feels like. So I was... Okay, so my story is kind of, I'm just going to like lay it out there, okay? <laughs> my story is that I was recently divorced. I was married, I married very young and had a son and he was about two, almost two. And I was living in, um, living in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, which is where the University of Kansas is. And I was working and I was kind of going to school part-time and my ex-husband uh, had moved out and got an apartment. So his, um, his roommate, who I, who I met later, like uh, after he had you know, gotten that apartment, he would come over and take care of our son when it, was, uh, when it was his turn and I would go stay with my friend because it was just easier because you know, like I had the kid-friendly thing and he had the apartment with the roommate kind of thing. So one day I told him, you know, like, I, I can't, like, my friend is busy or I don't know, I don't have anywhere to go. And he said, well, my roommate's going out and he's going to be, you know, like, out the whole weekend. Why don't you come over and stay here? And then I'll stay at your place. And I was like, okay, that's good. So I went there, but his roommate's plans got canceled. And so I met my husband there. And um, so, he st he, you know, he was there that first evening. So we went and played racquetball and... We were married two months later, so that uh, that I was still Christian, and he was Muslim, and he had never he's from Syria. He had never ever spoken to me about uh, Islam, or about religion. I mean, we talked like generally about religion, but we didn't talk in depth like what do you believe, what do what do I believe, you should believe what I believe. You know, there was no kind of pressure or pulling on either side. And then I started taking him to church. Because I really, you know, because I wanted to be a missionary, remember? So I really wanted him to, I mean, I believed that in order to be saved, he had to convert to Christianity. And over time, I saw his relationship with God. It kind of emerged to my eyes. Like it had obviously already existed, but Ramadan came and I saw him fasting. And of course, I saw him praying and I saw... I, I just saw a relationship, whereas I, I didn't really envision other faiths as having a living relationship with God. I kind of thought that that was unique to Christianity. And so I started kind of observing him, and then he gave me some books when we were married. And I dug those books out, and I reread the New Testament, and I... Start, and I read some of those books, and the last one that I read was called The Bible, the Quran, and Science. And that one really spoke to me. That, that really kind of hit me in the heart where I, I realized that all of the things that are in Quran that, are, that it talks about, like um, embryology and tectonic plate theory and, all, I mean, all of the... Uh, the estuaries, the, the division between salt water and fresh water, uh, where the rivers flow into the seas, all these kind of things, even things on microscopic levels that are in the Quran that there's no way 
that information could have been garnered from anyone else, from any other source, because a man in the middle of the 7th century, in the middle of the desert, who can't read and write, there's no way he got that information from anywhere else. And whereas the Bible talks about some of the same topics, the way it addresses them, it has incongruencies with itself, and incongruencies with history, and incongruencies with science, and the Quran doesn't have any of that. So, I kind of came to a decision that I believed that this information came from, from God. And if I believe that, well then, I guess I'm a Muslim. And so I put on a scarf. And th to me, that was what I, that was the only thing I, I knew at, at the beginning was scarf and tawheed and, and salah. And my husband taught me al-fatiha and bismillah mashallah he, he was, he never, never pushed, he was flabbergasted when I actually converted because he didn't, he didn't realize because he was like, I don't want to push you. I don't want to pressure you. I don't want you to feel later like you've been duped or something. So I'm not going to talk to you about it at all. You know, here's my mom's phone number. You can write her letters. You can talk to who so-and-so friend, whatever. Um, he gave me some, you know, he like kind of got me in contact with the sisters in the community. He said, but I I'm not going to talk to you about it. Um, so, so when I became Muslim and I, I woke him up because he worked nights and then I woke him up and I woke him up and I said, okay, I'm going to work and wear my scarf. And he was like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure? And, um, yeah, and I lost my job. They said, you need to take that off or leave. I was working at a place called Sunflower Cable Vision. It, I was just being a receptionist. I actually was working at a place that did, uh, conference calls back in the day young people before there were smartphones and Skype and all of that um, there were a conference called companies so you would call into these companies and they had these enormous pieces of equipment that were called bridges and they had 20 lines each and you connected the lines and you got to wear earphones and stay there and make sure that the lines stayed clear and if one line got static you had to turn that one down so you stay and pay attention to the to the call and we did like uh, the Democratic Convention, we did NBA with one of our clients. So it was a really fun job, it was great. But then we had this one employee who was kind of like going postal and he was saying things like, oh, you know, if I get fired, I'm gonna, I don't know what, blah, blah, blah. You know, he just, I was, I was uncomfortable and I was pregnant. So I said, okay, that's, that's enough. I'm gonna take a break. And so I took a leave of absence and I went and worked as a receptionist at this cable company. And they said, oh, we have an unwritten law, that an unwritten rule, that hats and bonnets aren't allowed, and we think that includes scarves. And so um, we, I sued them. Uh, I went to the Equal Opportunities Employment Commission, and they, uh, they did an investigation, and then they found cause, and then we sued them. And they, uh, they wound up having to, we settled out of court because it was right at the beginning of the first Gulf War and my lawyer was like, I don't know how sympathetic a jury would be at this time. And so, yeah, so we sued them and then we settled out of court and they had to post a, a poster that said, you know, like we don't discriminate, whatever, you know. So, yeah, it was so, sometimes, you know, subhanAllah, things just fall together. They had this unwritten rule, right? But they had a real rule in their actual rule book that said no tank tops or miniskirts but the girl that I replaced wore tank tops and miniskirts every day yeah so alhamdulillah then I, I became Muslim and and uh, alhamdulillah then we lived in Kansas City for a long time and uh, really became part of the community there and grew with them no but I do wish that I had, okay, so I'm studying with Rawaha, which has a four level um, program for actually, for like a Daya program, you know? It has different tracks. It has like Islamic studies teacher track and, you know, different things. Uh, it has just, an, just Arabic and Quran Tajweed track. And then it has an actual Daya track. It's four levels, but for example, this is my third year and I'm just now finishing the first level. So it's, it's an extensive, rigorous program. You get ijazes as you go along, you know, actual ijazes. So I really wish I would have had access to that kind of learning earlier. That's my regret. Like, I, I spent 15 years not really knowing anybody, not really knowing where I could get the meat, you know? Like, where can I really learn, you know, beyond the, the basics, you know? And I just didn't have access, subhanAllah, and I really used to be sad about that, and then I finally, 
finally, ex of course, as I knew intellectually from the beginning, Allah makes things happen when they're meant to happen. And there's a reason, and maybe I wouldn't have benefited from it before, I would have taken it for granted. Allahu anam, yani Allah knows what the reason is, but for whatever reason, this opportunity came to me when I was this age. I, I mean, I have granddaughters already. So in a way it's good because I raised six kids and now my kids are grown and they have kids and now I have the time to really devote to studying. So, you know, that may be part of the reason too. That's the only regret that I have as far as stuff that I used to be able to do. I mean, I don't know, I miss bacon. <laughs> but we have turkey bacon, you know, so I don't miss it that much. Okay, so first I want to say um, my advice to converts, and even to the youth. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's appropriate for everyone. Don't let yourself be bullied. And by bullied, I mean, don't, don't feel bad if, for example, you're praying in the masjid and an auntie comes up to you and says, oh, you're praying wrong, or you're, um, your prayer's not going to be accepted, or you came late, or, you know, anything like that. Or people will tell, especially converts, they'll tell them things like, you have to get rid of your dog today. And, and you have to divorce your husband if they became Muslim when, they're, when they were already married to a Christian man or whatever. They'll tell them things like, if they're not married, you have to get married today. You know, let us find you somebody. Let us, you know, like the priority is marriage, not finding a good partner, right? Um, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of harshness. There's a lot of harshness directed toward, um, toward converts especially and the youth and a lot of condescension like as if you were perfectly capable of being intelligent enough and spiritual enough to make the decision to become Muslim but the minute you become Muslim you're infantilized like okay well now we have to treat you like you're a child and you don't know anything and we have to uh, you know we have to like put you in this very narrow chute and shove you in this box and tell you have to do this and you can't do this and you can't do this and you have to do this and it's just, it's overwhelming for people at the beginning. And a lot of it is not true information. Or it's true in one madhab, but it's not true in another. Or it's things that people practice back home that's part of their tradition and their culture, but they don't realize that it's not based in the deen. It's not based in religion. It's just based in tradition and culture. So people become either uh, overwhelmed, or they become disillusioned, or they become very lonely. And we really have to fight against that. In Rabata, we have a program called Project Lina. And it's a two-day workshop. It's a nine sessions um, of, about, uh, you know, living as a convert. And there are three modules. The first one is know, uh, bring your whole self to Islam. Know yourself and bring your whole self to Islam. Don't let people tell you, for example, oh, you were a singer before. There's nothing for you in Islam. You have to change. You have to be something else. Okay, go sing nasheeds, go, you know, like, go to women's weddings, and you can, there are outlets, you know, there are absolutely ways that you can use that talent, and it's meaningful. Um, the second one is uh, declare your independence, which is, which means study enough so that you know the basics of the religion and nobody can tell you, for example, oh, haram, you're praying with your hands down or up or whatever, you know, people will say, oh, you're praying with your hands down? Haram, you know, like this is not, but they don't know Maliki's praying with their hands down. You know, like there's, there's all kind of people, reasons for people to kind of tell you this is wrong or that is wrong. Study enough so that you know what's right and wrong. And if you don't know, of course, everything, because none of us knows everything, you know who you can ask to find out. You know, you have someone you trust that you know they're going to give you the real deal and they're not going to be, you know, shoving something down your throat. And the third module is, uh, um, tend your ties. So, so important to tend your ties, um, to keep your family relations, to even if your parents disown you, even if they have a, go through a period of time where they don't want to talk to you because you became Muslim or whatever, uh, even if your, your brothers and sisters talk about you behind your back, be kind, no matter what. Be kind, be kind, be kind. Show them uh, that Islam is kindness. It's not what they see on TV. Uh, you know, go to things that they invite you to and invite them to your things. And if they don't come, keep inviting, keep inviting, keep inviting. Eventually, inshallah, inshallah, they'll see, um, they'll see that, that real faith shining from you and they'll understand that that's what Islam is about. And tend your ties also with your community. 
you know, reach out, find sisters, don't sit around and be alone, find other people that you can, that are like-minded. So, and, and for the youth I, youth, I would just give basically those, that same advice, that same advice, and also, don't be lazy. <laughs> um, working with youth, I see a lot of, a lot of situations, even my own self, I have to say it, I have to admit it, that before I met Ansi Tamra and before I became involved in Robata and really understood what himme is, what drive is, what, you know, what, what, working f what working for the good is and fighting the good fight is and that it, it entails working a lot, I was lazy. So just know that you're, no matter what you do in life, you're not going to have success unless you're getting up at Fejr and taking advantage of that barca and, you know, going on from, with your day from there. And that includes your dunya and your akhirah. You're not going to be successful in your business, and you're not going to be successful in your spiritual life unless you're really, unless you really go for it. Guidance, and that's something you have to ask for. It doesn't necessarily, sometimes it just falls in your lap, but, but it's also something that you have to yearn for. You know, Allah says, if you come toward me a, one uh, a hand's length, I'll come toward you an arm's length. If you come toward me uh, walking, I'll come to you running. But who's doing the first action? In all of those, in that hadith, we are doing the first action. If you, if you come toward Allah, hands linked, Allah isn't running away. You're the one who's, you know, we might be the one who is in ghafla, you know, like we're pay, we're being a little heedless. We're not paying attention. We're slacking on our salah. Whatever it is, we slipped, not Allah. So we need to like try to move back. And the minute you turn your face toward Allah, he's there to gather you in. So just, yeah, don't be lazy and don't despair. If anything that I've said, in this interview is helpful and beneficial, it's a blessing from Allah, and if anything that I've said in this uh, interview is uh, harmful or incorrect or offensive, it's my own mistake, and please forgive me. Thanks so much for watching. Now we want to hear your story. <laughs>